three times before you have felt the terror, known the madness, lived the horror. But this is the one you've been screaming for. Spooktacular Numero Cuatro, the killer clown from outer Chicago. Freelance jobs can be a great way to make money, unless your boss happens to be John Wayne Gacy. Because on his construction site, nobody leaves it alive. He simply, maniacally, mercilessly kills. Welcome to the psycho circus of one of history's most heinous serial killers. That's today on Death in Entertainment, Halloween edition. Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? You're in Hollywood now. Two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my God. Shocking new details that has stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. <laughs> we call this thing anyway. Death in entertainment. <laughs> Greetings, Dead O Universe. Hello there. Welcome to the fourth edition of our annual Halloween spooktacular. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't even laugh or else I'll go into a coughing fit. I was surprised I was able to just do that. <laughs> What's up, everybody? My name's Kyle Plouffe. And I'm Alejandro Dowling. And sticking with the serial killer theme, we are taking on John Wayne Gacy for the spooktacular this year. We started off in Wisconsin. For the first one. The second one, we stayed in Wisconsin. Yeah. Halloween Killer. Yep. Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm-hmm. First one was Eddie Gein. That's right. And then last year, we went to your turf. Yeah. Boston. Bombs over Boston. Very personal episode. Yeah, well, we found out my cousin is the suspected murderer of uh, a couple in Massachusetts. I never would have thought that your cousin would make the Boston Strangler more likable. <laughs> look like uh, the Boston uh, Cuddler. <laughs> <laughs> Makes him look like Tom Brady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we got our candy here. I have a Skittles flavored uh, energy drink here. Actually. Ooh. Yeah. Kill two birds with one stone. That's right. Get my diabetes mainlined. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Before we get things going, though, we actually have a special ghost with us today. Oh. Who wanted to do the intro. Okay. Should we let him in? Let's let him in. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, my God. Look who it is. It's the first draft Crypt Keeper. Wow. Gee, have you lost weight? <laughs> Good evening, boils and ghouls. First, I have to slay that this is my favorite podcast kid. Alejandro and Vile always make me shriek with laughter. <laughs> oh, that means a lot. Warms my heart. Speaking of, word of warning, kitties. This is a true crime comedy show. So if chuckles aren't your thing, then go stumble into another graveyard. Maybe you'll find your funny bone there. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. So tell them about today's episode. Tonight's Halloween dead time story is about a homicidal clown who had a real stranglehold on the construction business. Young men from all over Chicago were dying to work with him. Literally. It's a tale so twisted your stomach will be tied up in knots. You may need some intensive scarapy after this one. So without further abu, let's start the Screecher presentation. How about that? That was nice to have the first draft Crypt Keeper intro for us. That it was very special. Wow. We appreciate that. Honored. Yeah. We've had quite a collection lately. We've had Joe Exotic. Yeah. Chris Todd. <laughs> and a skeleton. Jamal Millwood. <laughs> <laughs> we had Jamal Deadwood today. Yeah. So now we go to 
Chicago. Ooh. Back to the Midwest. Going, going, back, back. John Wayne Gacy was born in Chicago on March 17th, 1942. Mm. That's St. Patrick's Day, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I bet it was pretty rowdy at the hospital. <laughs> A lot of green jello. Yeah. Well, that actually does make sense. Whoa. Whoa. Hello. The Skittles are Woo, barking. Coming back up, yeah. <laughs> Green Jello actually does make sense. They're the band that uh, came up with that song. Little pig, little pig, let me in. Green Jelly. No, it was Green Jello, and they got sued by Jello Shut and became Green Jelly. Up. Yeah, it's real. Because I know someone that's in the band, and we talked about it. Wow. And the Big Bad Wolf was born on this day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so John's dad was named John. His name is my name, too. His dad was an auto repair guy. Oh. A mechanic. Good with his hands. Yes. He's not the only one in the family good with his hands, mm. for better or worse. <laughs> and he was a World War I veteran, so oh. we thank him for his service. Good with his guns. Maybe he shouldn't have had any kids, but besides that. Yeah. And his mom, Elaine, was a homemaker. Well, she made homes. That's what they used to call them in those days, homemaker. Housewife. Doesn't sound, doesn't have the ring to it that no. Homemaker does. Desperate Homemaker. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a great show. John had two sisters and he was overweight, bad at sports. Ah, that's why he's mad. He had a strained relationship with his dad because his dad would call him a sissy boy. Well, we saw this with Aaron Hernandez as well. Didn't turn out so well for both of them. No. And then besides all that other stuff... Little John would have blackouts due to an, an enlarged heart. Oh, he's got the Grinch syndrome. His heart threw three, si three sizes that day. <laughs> Which doesn't make that much sense then in his case. No. He had a big heart. His heart was too big. People had to die. <laughs> it was so full of love. <laughs> when he was 14, he was hit by a swing at the local park with brute force. After that, he experienced a period of epileptic seizures. Oh, he's I a had, mess by the time he's yeah, 14. No, <laughs> you almost feel bad for him at this point. At this point, sure. I had a similar experience once at a park where I was on one of those whirly things that goes round and round mm -hmm. that you push yourself, like someone pushes it for you. Oh, just, those things were deadly. You just hang on. Yeah. Well, I didn't hang on, mm. and I flew off and hit my head. I was unconscious for 20 minutes or... Yeah, those things are made of steel and they go so fast. Yeah. If you tried to jump on, I did that once. I smacked my head so hard. You get major concussions. You can break your arms, legs, <laughs> everything. Yeah. They were so dangerous. I'm sure it wasn't 20 minutes, but all I remember is coming to on the walk home. Oh, you were already like, your body was already moving and you just weren't aware. I guess. Anything. Oh my God. And my head really hurt. Yeah, that's a concussion for sure. Oh boy. Okay. Well, I don't think it's affected me too much. <laughs> then when little John was nine years old, things got worse. There was a contractor in the neighborhood who befriended him. That sounds like a nice guy. Yeah, he showed him some wrestling moves and would take him to the movies. Oh, and he molested him. Oh, it all sounded too good to be true. <laughs> okay, so very tragic story so far. Yeah. But it gets better, folks. Okay. Actually, it doesn't. <laughs> it gets worse and worse and worse. Oh, boy. So if you want an uplifting episode, go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John ran away from home in 1961. And do you know where he went? Um, Las Vegas. Oh, where all the runaways go. He lived in a mortuary. Oh, <laughs> Can boy. you believe that? Wow. I mean, he, I can. Well, he worked there. <laughs> and I guess he slept on a cot there. You do what you love. You never work a day in your life. And he made this clear in one of his interviews. He did not sleep in the embalming room. He slept close to the embalming room. Right. I can't imagine the mortuary being too big. So every room was probably close to the embalming room. There's a rumor that he used to cuddle up with the boys who would be brought in. I've heard that. But he wanted to make it clear in that same interview that that's hogwash. Hogwash. That it's ridiculous to suggest that he would do that. That's what they bathed the fat bodies in. Oof. Hit them with the hogwash. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 
And you know, maybe it was worse than cuddling in real life with the dead bodies. I would assume so, yeah. Would you believe he found a girl to marry him? Wow. Her name is Marlon Myers. Poor lady. They had two kids together. Her dad owned a bunch of KFC franchises in Iowa. Oh, moneymaker. Gacy joined the team. <laughs> he got into the family business. Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, that was up and coming then. Oh, yeah. It was a phenomenon. The Colonel. Special recipe. It's people. Oof. So I think that was going good for a little while. John's sister, Karen Kuzma, said that her brother was a good, kind, hardworking family man. This family, Marilyn Myers, Karen Kuzma, they only want alliteration names. Well, it's easier to say. I guess so. I have a clip here of John's sister on Oprah talking about him later on in her life. Interesting. When she finally revealed that she was, in fact, his sister oh, publicly. She kept it on her wraps. Yes. Wouldn't you? <laughs> I don't know. I told everybody my cousin was a murderer. Yeah, but that's, you know. <laughs> on a podcast internationally. So when was this picture taken? This was hours before he was transferred. To be executed? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people uh, would probably think looking at that photo that, you know, how could you be hugging him or whatever. But They're hugging and smiling. You would think this is like way before she found out he killed anybody. No. Never mind like 40 people that were buried under his house. <laughs> to each their own. This looks like Thanksgiving dinner way before there was any murder. Remember Susan Klebold on the TED Talk? Oh, yeah. She's like proud of her son being the gunman. Yeah, I'm not a bad parent. <laughs> You're a bad parent. Yeah. What did I do wrong? <laughs> Just because I raised him as a murderer? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and we continue. That, you know, how could you be hugging him or whatever, but... He was my brother. You know, I didn't See, ever Kyle? know the evil part of him. Do you think differently about him now? <laughs> I don't like that part of him. I hate that part of him. Did you ever talk to any of the victim's families? No, the attorneys wouldn't allow us to. They said that yeah, it's okay. like admitting that he is guilty. Is that one of the things you regret? Yes, I do. Yeah. I do. I understand you just told your boss last week that who your brother was. I did. <laughs> See, the name Gacy has been buried. My sister has... Like 37 story. gay people under your <laughs> brother's you. house. Yeah, I was just going <laughs> to say the same thing, and I would have worded it differently. But <laughs> oh, Passed man. away a few years ago. Her husband wouldn't even use her maiden name on her death certificate. I've never given my maiden name out. The people, my neighbors, are now, if they watch Oprah, are going to find out who I really am. Mm. <laughs> Surprise! Wow. And she's tried to contact Gacy's two children through the years, and they want nothing to do with her. Oh, because I think she's like a blowhard or like a, she's a clout chaser. No, I just think they don't want anything to do with anything with Gacy. Oh, they just distance themselves from the family because they're not taking pictures smiling with them. Their identities are unknown. Wow. Nobody knows anything about Gacy's two kids. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Which is for the best, Jeez. I would say. For them, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by that when these evil people have offspring. Mm. What a weight. What a load to carry. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of loads. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, God. What, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that the Bin Ladens, there was like a big uh, news story that the... They get a bad rap. Yeah, they, they, you know, they, but they are like respected here for some reason, like still work with the government. <laughs> They're the only ones who were allowed to fly on 9-11. Yep, that's right. If your last name was Bin Laden, they allowed you <laughs> to get on an airplane. I've been flying. <laughs> At this point in Gacy's life, he's in Iowa. He's frying chicken. He's got the family. Things are going swell, yeah. as they used to say in those days. <laughs> he's uh, he's burying his impulses. <laughs> Looks like we have the first draft Crip Keeper with us right now. <laughs> <laughs> he joined a club called the JCs, which was the Waterloo Junior Chamber of Commerce. It's some sort of political Elks Club bullshit. Kind yeah. Of thing. And he was a major leader, had a lot of great leadership skills. Wow. He was voted Man of the Year by the JCs. <laughs> Which means absolutely nothing, but what still, a <laughs> it's a good bullet point on their resume. Jesus. He was responsible for boosting their membership. How do you think he did that? I don't know. 
stag films. Oh, wow. Which are known as pornos today. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, they would have screenings and they would get people to sign up. To make them? No, just to, just I don't to know. Watch yeah, like come watch porn and. I just want to see some tits and hang out yeah, with guys. Yeah, you want to be part of the community? <laughs> I'm sure Gacy did the old popcorn trick with some of them. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Want to come down to the Junior Chamber of Commerce and watch Debbie Does Dallas? Man, check out that girl's tits. Meanwhile, his fist is clenching a guy's cock. (laughs) And then Karen Kuzma, I'm going to say her full name every time, Uh his sister. The original Karen, by the way. Oh. I wonder if she's ever had a public meltdown about (laughs) McDonald's not serving breakfast after 11. Don't you know who I am? (laughs) She was shocked one night when she went to one of these JC's events and noticed that there was some partner swapping going on. Whoa. Do you ever get the sense that before we were born, there was a lot of nefarious and lascivious things going on? (laughs) In the culture. Yeah, there's no cameras anywhere. (laughs) And as Gacy rises in the community as a leader, he starts to think he's above the law. He's like a sovereign citizen that we saw the other day. Right. Can you explain the whole sovereign citizen thing? Essentially, it's just people that get pulled over and claim that they're sovereign citizens, so they don't have to actually be stopped. They don't. Police have no authority over them. They don't Uh, need a license. Yeah. And there was one woman that said, okay, this is my fee schedule. This is for you taking up my time. So this is what you have to pay me for taking up my time right now. It was very, you know, it was brazen Mm -hmm. to want to charge the cops for pulling her over. You know, it seems like a great deal. I would love to do that. Yeah, she was one of the Moorish people of uh, Ohio or something. (laughs) Yeah, well, we have Moorish to get through right now. Let's do it. In this episode. So let's continue. (laughs) That's essentially, though, what Gacy is at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Also that he's an outspoken liberal, he uses that as a sort of smokescreen. Like, I'm a good guy. I'm bisexual. Actually, he did call himself bisexual. He admitted he was bisexual. Yeah. Not gay. He says, I don't swing that way. (laughs) I prefer women, but I'm bisexual, he said. (laughs) I don't swing that way unless I do. (laughs) Don't you get it? (laughs) So then what does he do next for fun? A guy. He not a guy, a boy. <laughs> oh god. 16 years old. Jesus. Named Dom Voorhees. This is 1968. And we're still in Iowa and he gets arrested for oral copulation with a minor. Oh boy. Because guess who that Don kid was? Jason Voorhees. <laughs> he wishes. Yeah. He was the son of a state representative. Oh boy. So that's a powerful family. And Don went and contacted police about Gacy. God. But then Gacy fired back and said it was consensual and that Don was blackmailing him. Oh, my God. He blamed the kid. (laughs) That's crazy. Yes. (laughs) Absolutely insane. That's what they do on To Catch a Predator as well. That's she what, was asking for it. She invited me over. That's what they did with Drake Bell and uh, Alan Thick and a bunch of other people. Alan Thick. Yeah, they wrote letters uh, oh. saying to Brian Peck, oh, he was just an over-sexualized hot kid that was <laughs> teasing Mr. Peck. It's disgusting. <laughs> These people are awful people. But people would believe it if they said, this kid is blackmailing me. They'd be like, oh, this this hot young boy. How was Brian supposed to say no to a hot piece of ass like that? Yeah. That was the argument they made in Listen, court. I'm, I'm America's dad. I know this. I happen to know character. <laughs> By the way, Brian Peck and Drake Bell are going to be referenced again later on. In this episode? Yes. What the fuck? So thank you for that teaser, Kyle. Wow. Let's see how we get there. We have a few things in between, though. Sure. Gacy's parents wouldn't have any of it, however. They didn't believe that their son would do that with a minor. Oh, my God. Of course not. Johnny's a good boy. That's my boy. Needless to say, Marlon filed for divorce. Good. And she took the kids and ran, and they've never been heard from again. Well, that sounds pretty ominous, but I hope that they're alive and well. And... They are. That's I just mean. They've never <laughs> been heard up from. <laughs> they were never heard from again. 
I just mean that they distanced themselves and good. They got they, away. They like it that way. Yeah. Anonymity. Perfect. You know, Marlon was part of the big fried chicken dynasty there. Yeah. They would receive complaints that Gacy had been overly friendly at the KFC restaurants. Oh, with, yeah? With customers. Wow. Particularly, particularly young males. Oh, God. Mr. Gacy is then sent to the Anamosa Reformatory. <laughs> You know that place. Yeah, the reformatory. He got caught trying to drag a kid into the bathroom to show, oh. <laughs> see him shove chicken up his ass. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah. Think of the things he didn't get caught for, because this is obviously for that Don Voorhees incident. But, to the reformatory with you. must have happened quite a bit. Yeah. And that was just the time he got caught. Right. Jesus. Um, <laughs> fried chicken up the ass, Kyle. Really? <laughs> yes. Come on. This is a family show, okay? Yep. By the way, I'm not eating at KFC anytime soon after this. No? I'm done with KFC and Subway. I'm going straight there. Ever since Jared. I mean, Subway sucks anyway. It's yeah. the worst food in the entire planet. You forced me to eat there once, and I'm still kind of mad at you about it. But, <laughs> you were disgusted. But I'm done with Subway and KFC. Anyway, <laughs> we're at the reformatory now. Okay. And wouldn't you know it, Gacy... Is having a grand old time, a gay old time. Hey, a bisexual old time. And now. he becomes a leader there. Oh my God. He would tell the other inmates that he was in there for something else. Yeah, of course. He didn't admit what actually happened. So he's leading <laughs> the, all the most like depraved souls. He told them he was distributing porn or something like that. Oh, it was the stag films. I yeah. Trouble. Okay. Then we come to. A tragic holiday. Old Papa Gacy died on Christmas Day while little John was incarcerated. Oh. And he never forgave himself because he thought that his dad died of shame, which I think he did. He probably did, yeah. My son sucks. I'm a war hero. My kid's a little sissy boy. So it shows <laughs> the slightest bit of humanity that he even cared that his dad died. He might not have cared. Hmm. He might be emulating what he thought someone who should care mm. would do. Right, like the Coneheads. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> would you like to partake with, what is it, flesh on <laughs> fire with us this weekend? <laughs> Barbecue. Chewing gum. <laughs> He's eating a condom. <sighs> they probably learned that <laughs> trick from Casey. Could be. Hey, kids, you want some gum? <laughs> so... Gacy served 18 months. Then he was paroled and moved to Chicago. He was transferred via the Interstate Compact Agreement, it's called. Yeah, Illinois is going, gee, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for sending this one over. <laughs> Although it did kind of put them on the map. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, they got the Chicago Fire, Second City, <laughs> Gacy. <laughs> Sister Karen said that he changed after that. He changed. He Re reformed. The, no. <laughs> no, she says he changed for the worst oh, after that no. experience. Yeah. She thinks that's what really set him off. The reformatorium. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is interesting. A report by the Iowa State Psychopathic Hospital called him, quote, a sexual psychopath with no cure. Wow. And a dangerous predator. Uh, yeah, they nailed it. And then, this might shock you, he was actually supposed to be locked up until 1978. So he's supposed to be there for another 10 years? Yeah. Oof. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but 1978 is the year he was finally arrested. Whoa. So you do the math. How many people could have been saved if he had been locked up in that reformatory? It's a decade of destruction. Well, we'll find out how many people could have been saved. Once in Chicago, Gacy had a job lined up at Bruno's Pizzeria. I don't like this guy being around my food. Yeah, he's handling a lot of chicken and pizza. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like it one bit. Like, I didn't order sour cream on this 
pepperoni. I used to work at the mortuary. Now come on down to Bruno's Pizza. Yeah, what the fuck? Why would you want a guy serving your pizza slices if he was a sex pest? <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's like not the place, like a factory maybe. Right. Yeah, manufacturing of some sort. Like a chocolate factory. <laughs> Like Dahmer. Mm. Say what you will about Jeffrey Dahmer. He was a hard worker. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't like McDonald's. He didn't? No. Because someone was saying, let's get McDonald's. He's like, I don't eat that crap. Really? Dahmer was above McDonald's? But he ate people. Oh, yeah. He, he had finer taste. Yeah. As they say. <laughs> Mama Gacy moved there with him. Wow. And she gave him a $600 loan. This is like when Trump got a million dollars from his dad. I got a very small loan of a million dollars. <laughs> the fuck? So Gacy started getting painting work, and then he turned that into a remodeling business. So as quick as he was serving up those pizza slices, he found a better career path. Mm. And he found he was pretty good at it. Yep. Because, you know, he's got leadership qualities. He's resourceful. Yeah. And he called his new company PDM Construction. Painting, decorating, and maintenance. So this is annoying. Mama Gacy bought him a house. Oh, that's very nice. At 8213 West Somerdale Avenue in the unincorporated city of Norwood Park. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, nice. You just got out of jail for having sex with an underage boy. <laughs> Let me get you a house. Let me get you a house that you can now have them over all the oh, time. Oh, my God. So do you need any handcuffs, honey? It was a thousand square feet. The neighborhood is very working class. Nice, though. Yeah. But it ain't, you know, Beverly Hills. Unassuming. <laughs> and listen to this. Gacy found another woman to marry him. Wow. This he, guy's on fire. He married his sister's friend, Carol Hoff. Mm. Sometimes referred to as Carol Lofgren. Oh, boy. And he became a stepdad to her two little girls. She later said that he was a wonderful stepfather. Wonderful. And at this point, Mama Gacy moves out <laughs> to give them their space. Hit the bricks, Mom. And he put her up in, in an apartment nearby. One night, she, she came home and she found Gacy in her living room naked, having sex with another man. Yeah. And it startled her. The mom did or the wife? The mom. Oh, wow. Oh, should oh I, in her living room, in her apartment. I I, let me rephrase this to make it make more sense. So that's nice of him to put his mom up in a... Yeah. Apartment, you know, you know, paying her back a little bit. Yeah, exactly, because the PDM is kind of rolling right now. Yeah. Well, it's not all fun and games, <laughs> because one night, Mama Gacy, presumably after running some errands, yeah, wants to come home and relax. Yeah, put on her stories. Yeah, watch some murder she wrote. Heat up a Swanson TV dinner. Yeah. She's well, in, alone in her own apartment. She enters and in the living room finds her son, Johnny Boy. Entering a man. Naked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> having sex with another man. And she's startled. She drops her gro groceries like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And they don't talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Why? How could you? <laughs> they sit there eating their hungry men. <laughs> In more ways than one. <laughs> um, yeah, she's like, I was just trying to eat my hungry man. <laughs> Meanwhile, you got a mouthful. <laughs> eat your protein, Johnny. Oh boy. So, so she had to have at that point known suspected that suspected that he was gay. he might have been a little gay. Because <laughs> I wonder if she thought 
that he wouldn't have hooked up with another guy in general or if he wouldn't have hooked up with an underage boy. I don't my know. son is a married man. He would never do anything like that. And she comes home and he's just blasting away in her new apartment. Well, we saw that with <laughs> Dahmer's granny. God, the smell of that room must have been awful. Oh, my God. <laughs> but remember, Dahmer's granny was the same way. Yeah. She witnessed him doing a lot of shit in that house. Yeah. In, in and, the TV show, she was like, you stay away from this man. You know, they still hold out hope that their <laughs> their kid or grandkid can be a normal person. I don't know, man. Sometimes you just got to let go. <sighs> yeah. Well, if you're listening out there, parents who have freakazoid, dangerous kids. Just admit it. It's over and yeah. get, walk away. Move on. Don't be in denial your whole life. Right, yeah. Just, you know, accept it, move on. It's like those talk shows, like Maury in the 90s. Yeah. If your son is a homicidal maniac, (laughs) give us a call. (laughs) Give us a call. (laughs) (laughs) They make it sound so nice. Yeah. (laughs) So Jeffrey's new wife, Carol, could sense that he was leading two lives. Mm. And... She noticed he would meet young boys late at night in their garage. Oh, boy. The garage became his man cave. Ah. And man cave is also what he nicknamed his anus. (laughs) Stick it right in my man cave. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Oh, chicken bone. Carol thought that he was a drug dealer. Wouldn't that have been nice? (laughs) And she found a large crowbar in his car. In his anus. And she asked him, what's this for? And then he grabs it angrily like, you asked too many questions. What's a crowbar for? He has a construction company. I mean, that's not that crazy to own a crowbar. It was cartoonishly large, though. (laughs) (laughs) And it had blood and hair on it. It had a dildo at the end of it. Oh, God. Um, Let's go to a clip of Carol Hoff. Okay. I was always on him about the smell in the house. I couldn't stand it. It smelled like dead rats. Oof. And I used to tell him, I said, you really got to get somebody or do something. There must be something dead under the house. Yeah, it's a boy. He said, there, he said, there isn't anything dead under the house. I said, yes, there is. I can smell it and I know the smell. At something dead under there. I'm like, I was right. There were dead things under that house. That just freaked me out. And the youngest girl had her bedroom right there where that crawl space was. Oh, my God. They're talking about his daughter. Well, her daughter. Yeah. But his stepdaughter. Yeah. Right. But she said it like the youngest girl. Yeah. Uh, it was a weird way to say it, like your own daughter. Oh. Wait, now you're condemning the wife? What did she do? It was just, I'm saying, if you you're don't just like her li- syntax. If you're listening to that without knowing who she's talking about, oh, it, it I seemed see. very distant. She could have well, just said, my youngest daughter. Well, good thing we knew the context, Kyle. <laughs> Carol filed for divorce. He said something odd during their last encounter. He told her she'd be reading about him in the paper one day. Nailed it. (laughs) So what do you think happens now that she and the girls are out of the picture? You think he... He probably reforms and gets better. Yeah, settles down, focuses on the business. Yeah. I think once she's gone, then he probably really has time to reflect. And he doesn't have the, um, you know, sometimes it's a rush to... Uh, do bad things right under someone's nose. Like mm-hmm. some people get off on cheating and he was probably that guy. And yeah. so he's probably completely fine now. In reality, he started throwing parties and inviting every young guy. Oh, son could, of a bitch. He could find. <laughs> and these parties were debaucherous. God. Imagine a Freddie Mercury party mm-hmm. and take away the money. <laughs> The money, charm, charm, <laughs> talent, talent, yeah. humanity. So you want to see my paintings? <laughs> I painted a clown. <laughs> Fucking dork. 
By the way, the house was filled with pictures of clowns. Yeah. And we're going to get to his clowning very soon. <laughs> yeah. Also in the house was this tiki bar pool table, which you would love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd be a sucker in there. And then he made a bunch of copies of his house keys. So he would hand them out to different boys so that they could come and go. Oh. So it's kind of like a trap house. Yeah. <laughs> Double meaning there, too. Mm -hmm. So do you remember that exploitation movie from many years ago? Sure do. Called Gacy. Yep. Starring Mark Holton, who played Francis in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. My father said I could have anything I want. You'll be sorry, Pee Wee. <laughs> Good for you and your father. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> You're not going to do the peewee laugh? I can't right now. Let's see it. Ah! Nope, can't do He's it. He's going to cough if he does it. Yeah, the whooping <laughs> cough. We're still, if you haven't been keeping up, we still have the aftershocks of the whooping cough from July. I'm trying not to have a seizure again, so that, that would uh, probably force me into one. Yeah, so this movie, Gacy, from 2003... I actually fairly enjoyed it. Yeah, Gacy and Bundy were the two movies that came out right around the same and time. And Ed Gein. Yes, and Gein. Uh, th they were all pretty good, actually. Yeah. But this one in particular, it shows this side of Gacy the best. They didn't have the budget to do necessarily to show the whole scope of his crimes. But this part, the way he would deal with these young guys, they did great. So we have a clip of that. Just laying down some line. Want to strap on the rubber and come help? Uh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Lighten up. Come on. Let's go smoke a bowl. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, are you sure you don't want to call your parents and let them know you're okay? I mean, they must be worried. Sick. Fuck them. <laughs> okay. Let's show you to your room. Yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and crash anyway. So early? See you in the morning. And Kyle, can you describe what he sees in his room? He's in <laughs> his daughter's room. <laughs> the old stepdaughter's room. Yeah, and there's two beds in there. There's uh, TVs and radios all over one. And, uh, you know, it's just a bunch of um, girly things around the room. Well, there's more to come. Yeah. Some sort of flogging device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, not what you really expect to see hanging on yeah, the door. That wasn't a wind chime that you just heard. <laughs> oh, boy. So that's how he would test the guys. He would smoke weed with them. Yeah. And then... You know, make a move, and then if they rebuffed his advance, he'd be like, ah, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> Let me show you a magic trick. Some of them, too, he would show, well, this movie depicts it like he would show footage of him performing as a clown. Yeah. And then that would turn into a gay porn he would start projecting <laughs> and then see how they would react. Yeah. And the guy goes, there aren't any women in this. <laughs> I don't see him here either, tough guy. <laughs> Take your pants off. This is a real sausage party. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. One of those young guys that comes to live with him is named Michael Rossi. So he does work for the PDM construction company, lives there. When he moves out, his friend David Cram takes his place at the house. Cram. But, but Michael, <laughs> Michael uh, and David remain his loyal confidants mm. and secondhand guys. And they would go down on him in exchange for things. What? Like money. Oh, my God. And curiously, they would inherit some pretty cool things from boys that happened to have ran away conveniently. Ran away. Yeah. Yeah. And it was these two guys, Michael and David, that began a very ambitious project at the house, digging a crawl space. Oh, that's nice. Because Gacy had a bum back. Yeah. 
So he couldn't do it. I can't do it, boys. Can you get in there? Yeah, so they asked him, oh, why are we digging this big crawl space beneath the house? So you can blow me more. And he said it was something about the the water line. So they're like, okay, that checks out. Yeah, it sounds good. Well, remember how I told you that John was always a natural leader? Mm-hmm. Well, in Chicago, it was no different. He got right into politics because right now... He is a successful small business owner. Yeah. And he's doing well financially. And he was a foot soldier in the precinct of Norwood Township. Okay. He would do all sorts of things. Like he was in charge of running the Polish parade. And this is interesting. He was such a figure there that he organized the reception for First Lady Rosalind Carter. And there's a famous photo that was taken of them together. Oh. My question is, how did he get Secret Service clearance with that sodomy conviction? Mm. That's kind of interesting. It's very interesting. So we sort of alluded to the fact that he liked to perform as a clown. Mm, He liked to perform a lot of things. His character was named Pogo, and he would perform twice a month. And so his shtick involved balloon animals, and he wore very clown-like makeup. No, I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. You know, like big blue paint around the eyes, red around the mouth. Like a juggalo. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) He would fit right in at an ICP concert, like Joe Exotic. (laughs) So he would also perform at children's hospitals, parades, and just... Kids parties in general. So crazy. So I have a clip here from a 1992 interview that was conducted by Gacy's pen pal, Craig Bowley, and FBI profiler Robert Ressler. Hmm. And he gives a little insight into his clowning here. I've always told people when, when I got into clown makeup, I regressed into childhood. It was fun being a clown because you could... You, you could be yourself or, or just let yourself go and act a fool. You could be slapstick and, and funny and have a good time. That's why I always enjoyed clowning. Clowning has taken a bad name I, because of what they've used in my case. So he ruined clowning? Yeah. <laughs> Before that, they weren't creepy at all. No, they were totally fine and everyone loved them. <laughs> So here I have another excerpt from what are called the Gacy tapes. Ooh. This is from that Netflix yeah. series. And these interviews were done between 1979 and 1980 by a member of his legal defense team. <laughs> and so in this clip, he goes further into why he liked being a clown. And there's some commentary from Michael Albrecht, a cop who was involved in his case. Mm. I clowned for the Democratic Party, and I used to be in a lot of parades. I enjoyed it. You know, I wasn't getting paid for it. I just enjoyed it to uh-huh. go visit, like, older people and old people's older homes. Older people, uh-huh. Or to see crippled children. <laughs> it's almost like the feeling you get out of coming out of church on Christmas Eve. But if I was in a bad mood, it was bad for me to be a clown. Because some of those kids can be little bastards, you know? Oh, God. You know, you want to grab them by the cheek, and instead of just, you want to whack the shit out of them. What? (laughs) While we were doing the surveillance, Gacy told me how, as a clown, you could sit on women's lap and talk to them and basically do whatever you want. You could feel them up, and they wouldn't say anything because you're a clown. No, when you clown, you're you're hiding your image. (laughs) There are things that you could do that you wouldn't do as a person. And then he ended that conversation by saying, you know what, Mike? Uh, Clowns can get away with anything. Clowns can get away with murder. Oof. Oh, my God. Before Gacy, clowns were a man's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> you can get away with everything. You can grab him by the put cock. Yeah. <laughs> so Gacy said he preferred young boys at his company. Because they were easier to train. And they were they were cheaper. Oh God. Easily impressed. Yeah. And yeah, of course, his charms worked on them because he was a master manipulator and a braggart. He just thought that his shit didn't stink. Mm. 
And he used his political connections as a shield. And of course, he had aspirations to run for public office one day. Ah. Much like Jose Menendez. Ooh. All right, so Gacy's double life is catching up with him now. Mm. Because he's having parties at the house. Random young boys are staying with him. In and out. Going missing. Yeah. Others are running away. So so they, so they, he said. Gacy would drive around in a black Oldsmobile that looked like a squad car. And this is how he would pick up the guys. He went to a place called Bug House Square, which was a gay area. And he picked up a guy named Jeff Rignall. Uh, abducted him, basically. Mm. Brought him back to the house. Beat him. Raped him. He had used uh, chloroform to make him unconscious. Oh, that's fun. And then he left him for dead where he originally picked him up. Oh, wow. So it's interesting that he let him go. And when he complained to the cops, they're like, well, isn't that what you gay guys do? (laughs) They had no compassion back in the day for gay men. Mm. So they basically... Assumed it was a consensual encounter. It wow. must have been. Because men can't get raped. That was the mentality. Hmm. And they didn't take it seriously. So then Jeff took it. Jeff took the lawn to his own hands and searched for the mystery car. And then he actually spotted it one night. <laughs> and he got the license plate number, called the cops again. Wow. And so Gacy was arrested, but then released on bond. I'm surprised they even arrested him like you could have you could have gotten anybody's license plate true it's like when Dahmer was arrested before the worst of his crimes yeah it's like why do you let him go mm. okay now i have a few examples of people that encountered gacy and lived to tell about it because there weren't a lot like that yeah okay so i have a clip of tony who told his story on the YouTube channel Soft White Underbelly. Mm. He was 14 years old at the time, living in Kentucky, and his parents were heavily involved with the Ken Lake State Park. And so that was his backyard. And he would play with tourist kids and whatnot. It was also a resort. Mm. So one day he meets a man in a black and brown leisure suit. Tony was wearing his orange swim trunks. And so the man asked him, what's there to do around here? And then he asked the kid if he'd like to have a beer with him. He, the kid's like, sure. And then Tony goes to his hotel room. Yeah. And he says he felt his hand graze his butt, but he wasn't sure if that was on purpose. But it was kind of weird. Of course, this is Gacy. So he hands him a beer, closes the curtains, locks the door, asks him some questions like, you enjoy sex books? And then throws a pile of porn mags his way. Oh, boy. And like the films at his house, Tony goes, these are all boys in this. <laughs> so let's listen to the clip here. I said, hey, there's, there's just boys in these books. And he says, I got something else you might like. So he goes to the other side Here's of the bed, puts ass. another suitcase up on the bed, opens it up. It's full of shackles and handcuffs and chains. And inside my mind, I'm thinking, this is, this is bad. i got to get out of here. Mm. So I take my beer. It was about half full. I set it down to my left heel. And I said, the next time he goes to the bathroom, I'm going to take this cooler, and I'm either going to throw it through the window or I'm going to move it where I can get away. So he goes in the bathroom again, and his uh, demeanor, his, uh, his eyes start to get a little squinty. And I'm a pretty big kid for 15, but I, I knew I didn't have enough. Uh, this was a powerful, powerfully built man. Mm. So while he's away in the bathroom, Tony hides the cooler in the corner. And when Gacy comes out, Tony asks for snacks, then asks for another beer. Gacy's like, okay. So he searches for the cooler. That's when Tony bolts for the door and undoes the locks. Mm. As he's making his escape, Gacy grabs at him and hits him a couple of times. And Tony runs home. He tells his mom the whole story. And then three years later, Tony's working at the marina, 
bumps into Gacy again out of the blue. And he's 18 now. Mm. So he goes up to Gacy, asks if he remembers them. Goes in a little closer, kind of like getting in his face. Yeah. Yeah, you remember me, don't you? I'm not 14 anymore. Yep. And Gacy plays dumb. Yeah, of course. Well, what do you mean? So I thought that was kind of cool that he sort of confronted him. Yeah, that's awesome. Good he went him. on to say that he, you know, when all the stories broke, that he tried to contact the cops to tell them, you know, like what had happened to him, if yeah. it helps. And they're like, we got enough bodies over here, kid. Like, <laughs> don't overwhelm us. Yeah. So they didn't really care. Jeez. There was another guy, Tony Antonucci, who worked for Gacy. And guy loves the Tonys. He does. <laughs> so one night after work, he's hanging out with Gacy at the place. Gacy tries to show him some wrestling moves okay. like the contractor used to do with him. Yeah. They engage in a little bit of horse play. And then Gacy tries to handcuff him. So Tony fights back and then drop kicks Gacy to the floor and puts the handcuffs on him. And then Gacy looks at him and says, you're the only one who not only got out of the handcuffs, but you got them on me. <laughs> like he was impressed or something. Yeah. And this Tony guy worked alongside another boy named John Butkovich. And his nickname was Little John because <laughs> Gacy was now Big John. Oh. Little John went missing, Tony remembers. And he was told by Gacy that he had quit. Yeah. And then this guy, Jack Merrill... Just came out with this story recently. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is a new story. He was picked up in downtown Chicago. Gacy pulled up next to him and invited him to party. They did some poppers, and then he threw a wet rag in his face. Jack woke up in Gacy's house and was raped. Oof. And then Gacy dropped him off near where he picked him up, like he did for Jeff Rigno. Mm. And then Gacy even gave him his phone number. Give me a call sometime. Like they had had a date or something. Let's do this again. So this guy, Jack, he's an actor now, just came out with this story and he has a one man show about it. Oh. I know how much you love people doing one man shows. Yeah. Like Rebecca Schaefer's mom. Oh, God. And so this show is called The Save. And that's a reference to his dad was a baseball writer who coined the term The Save. When a relief pitcher maintains his team's lead to win the game. His dad coined that term? I guess. Wow. And so here's a clip from People.com. Both my parents went to their graves without knowing, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I made sure that I never heard either one of them tell me that it somehow was my fault. Yeah, that from them is something I'll never have to hear. About 10 years ago, my sister Janet and I talked about it again. We only talked about it twice. Why didn't he kill you? She asked. Why did you survive? Certainly a worthy question. I'm not sure I like the delivery, but it's a good question. And I do have an answer. I had learned skills that I was able to put into use so that I didn't lose. You know, I didn't lose my life. I was able to, to maintain my save myself. I realized that the skills that I, skill set that I had as a kid allowed me, when my game got dicey, to maintain my lead and save the game. And I'm, I guess- He's really shoehorning that in there. <laughs> That's why I had to explain it before I had. That's my save. Yeah. Oh my God, he's, and he's really shoehorning that And he's in plagiarizing there. Liam Neeson. Yeah, I got I a have particular a, set of skills. And those skills are that he went along with Gacy's game plan instead of acting afraid. He said, oh, cool, sounds good. Yeah. That was what he said. And by the way, we can see this show right now in Venice if you want. Really? Yeah. It's being, let's do it. Being performed as we speak. Wow. We can go talk to him. It sounds yeah. like he likes to talk. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, we can give him a platform. Jack Merrill. I don't want to sound snooty or anything, but all the headlines said law and order actor Jack Merrill. 
Mm-hmm. Some of them even just said Law and Order actor opens up about surviving Gacy. So I'm like, Chris Maloney was attacked by Gacy? Oh, man. <laughs> it's like the Diary of a Wimpy Kid actor thing. Yeah, exactly. He was on three episodes of Law and Order in the 90s. Yeah. It was just the only credit in his IMDb that anybody had heard of. But I had nothing against Jack as an actor. It is true. His dad is Jerome Holtzman. Yeah, I didn't make that up. Yeah. Wow. I thought he was making it up. I thought he was like shoehorning his entire life into this guy or saying that his dad invented it when it really wasn't his dad, but that's really his dad. Yeah. So interesting. We may have some things to talk about. I was keeping my safe. Yeah. More to come from him, possibly, in wow. the future if we go check this show out. Absolutely. We can review it on our Patreon. Yes. I don't know if I've explained it enough at this point or hinted at it, but there's a lot of boys going missing around Gacy. Gacy's a bad man. Well, they weren't runaways. Gacy has been murdering his victims. Oh. He's not just raping them. What? He's also (laughs) killing them and burying them in that new crawl space of his. Oh. And he says that the first victim was a guy named Tim McCoy. But he was the last identified victim, but he was actually the first. He's, is he the driveway one? No. Okay. Well, what do you mean driveway one? Well, there was one victim that was found either under the driveway or under the garage. Yeah, it was the under concrete. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly. Him. Oh, okay. And this happened in January 1972. Gacy says that he killed him in self-defense yeah. because Tim had come at him with a knife. So then he grabbed the knife and stabbed him. I had to kill him in self-defense because he was self-defending himself against me. <laughs> and so here's a clip from the 1992 interview with Gacy where he talks about Tim McCoy. Tim McCoy's name wasn't put on him until 1988. Prior to that, he was known as unknown number nine. Mm-hmm. And he was buried by me in the crawl space. Mm -hmm. That's the only knowledge that I have of it. What was the circumstances of that? He was killed in the house uh, in self-defense. And who killed him then? I stabbed him. Yeah, and it was an issue with self-defense? Why why was was he in the process of assaulting you or or what? He was coming at me with a knife. I just took the knife away and twisted it in his hand, Mm -hmm. and that's what killed him. Mm -hmm. So, so at, at, at that point, uh, you, you yourself did bury him then in the crawl space. Right. And if you if you notice, he's under concrete. Did you bury any of the others in the crawl space? No, I had nothing. To, I, I had no knowledge of him. Yeah. Well, why, why that? <laughs> I love that he admits to certain things because that's what people do when they're really fucked. They start admitting to a few things, but then saying, well, I didn't do it all, though. I didn't know anything about <laughs> all the other ones. I'm not that sick. Yeah. Jeez. This fucking guy. The others in the crawl space? No, I had nothing. To, I, I had no knowledge of it. Yeah. Well, why, why is it that yours, your, your first one is there and then, you know, 20 some uh, others are, are buried down there as well? Did somebody know that you had done this with the first one, that giving them an idea? More than likely when drinking and getting high with the others, yeah. Admitting it to them. So you feel others then followed your suit in, in uh, using this as a burial ground? Without a doubt. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, that's a good idea that you had, sure. (laughs) His story changed quite a bit. Yeah. One moment he confessed to everything, then the next he said he was innocent. He is a compulsive, he was a compulsive liar. Yeah. Except when he admitted to everything. Yeah. (laughs) And he was telling the truth. Right. It's kind of like when Ted Bundy went on a whole campaign about how porn is bad for America and (laughs) <laughs> desensitizing the minds. It's all a distraction Yeah, from their evil. Mm. Let's get to the disappearance that a 15-year-old kid who worked at Nissan Pharmacy, popular at school, good athlete. This is the type of person people look for. Yes. <laughs> this is December 11th, 1978. And if the first victim really was 1972, this was a six-year reign of terror. So at the pharmacy, Rob runs into Gacy, and he knows that he can get more money working at PDM than the pharmacy. Yeah. And so he goes to talk to him. And here's a clip of his co-worker, Kim Byers, talking about that night. In December in Chicago, it is freezing. And the cash register was right at the front of the door, and people were in and out a lot, and I would get cold. And so... 
Rob had a very nice uh, blue down jacket, so I asked him if I could borrow it and wear it up at the front while I was working the cash register. There was a man, middle-aged man in you know, a flannel shirt walking around the store. I asked the pharmacist and he said, oh, he was a contractor who was there because they were thinking about doing some remodeling into the store. As the night was winding down, Rob came back to the front of the counter and said, hey, can I have my jacket back? I'm gonna go outside and talk to that contractor about a job. Mm. And then he put his jacket on and he went outside. And that was that. That was that. And the insane part about this is his mom was in the car, car running. Yeah. Waiting for him. Yep. Mom, I'll be right back. Never saw him again. Mm. And even more tragic is that it was his mom's birthday. Oof. So they were having a family dinner that night. Jesus. And she waited at the store for hours, asked him what's going on. She didn't know. So they filed a missing persons report very quickly mm. with the Des Plaines police. That's the closest jurisdiction, I guess, to Norwood Township. Mm. It's also where the pharmacy was. Yeah. Because you were saying that it's an unincorporated township, yes. which means it doesn't even have its own police. Exactly. Well, I, what a bad place. I wonder if the mother thought of that when she was buying the house. Like, there's no police here, honey. You can have sex with whatever boys you want. You think she was in on it? It sounds like this is the absolute worst place for him to have a home. She believed Johnny Boy was a good citizen, a oh, decent man. Yeah, having sex with a man in my apartment. Well, yeah, because he's a pillar of the community. Yeah. He's Pogo the Clown. And he would throw these big barbecues where he would dress up as Paul Revere <laughs> and then flip burgers on the grill and everyone had a great time. Oh, Johnny, you're so funny. Yeah. Oh, my God. He was a real cut up. Hello. The store owner of Nissan Pharmacy, Phil Torf, named Gacy as the contractor who was there. So that's huge. Yeah. And then they finally did a check on Gacy's background, and they saw that there was an outstanding battery charge in Chicago, <laughs> and that he had been imprisoned in Iowa for the sodomy of a 15-year-old boy. Oh, boy. Starting the alarm bells are going on. Yeah, there. there's a couple warning signs here. Des Plaines police officers then go to Gacy's home the following evening. And Gacy's ignoring them at first because he's claiming that he's on the phone with his sister talking about a death in the family. Yeah. How about death under the house? Hello. Then he finally opens the door and says, hey, all right, I'll meet you at the station later. I got to go run some errands. Yeah. Who knows what he was up to, but I guess at one point, he had a flat tire or something. And so when he finally shows up to the police station at around 3.20 a.m., he's completely covered in mud. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, it was the tire, huh? And he denied any involvement in Rob P.'s disappearance <laughs> and said that he had not offered him a job, but that spoke to him briefly or something. Yeah, he was the last person to see him alive. Well, at one point, I guess Gacy went back to the pharmacy because he had left his appointment book at the store or something. So anyway, th there's a lot of smoke, and he's claiming, there's no smoke. <laughs> yeah. The first search warrant was executed on December 13th, 1978, so two days after Rob's disappearance. Okay. And they interviewed Gacy for nine hours. <laughs> at the house, they found multiple items that seemed out of place. There was a class ring. He didn't have any kids in high school so. no there were some driver's licenses belonging to boys that were not him <laughs> there was a blue hoodie young men's underwear gacy was a big fat fuck yeah so if you find little underwear he ain't wearing it <laughs> he's just sniffing it they found sex toys oh. including a dildo and a syringe a hypodermic needle capsules of amyl nitrate a two by four with two holes drilled into each end, <laughs> handcuffs, shackles. They go up to the attic where they find some gay porn and vintage physique magazines. What's with all these guys having physique magazines? Clearly, it's Pee -wee. not for physique. <laughs> Pee Wee comes over. Hey, how much you want for those? <laughs> <laughs> 
there were two books, one called Gay Love Letters and another called Pretty Boys Must Die. Ooh. They found a film receipt in the trash can from Nissan Pharmacy, the place where Rob Peace worked. But there was not enough evidence to arrest him, apparently. Ugh. So the first day he was allowed to return home, that class ring that they found had the initials JS on it. And it was found later that it belonged to a missing boy named John Zick. Mm. And this is infuriating. Police had told his mom that her son most likely ran away and that she has to let him go. And then another guy, Greg Godzik, went to Gacy's house to pick up a paycheck and he wasn't seen again. While working for Gacy, he helped dig the trenches there. Disturbingly, he didn't realize he was digging his own grave. Mm. Never came home. And his car was found in a parking lot. His mom confronted Gacy and went to the police. So she knew what was going on. I really got lost in his work. Yeah. Uh, So that receipt in the trash can from Nissan Pharmacy belonged to Kim Byers, who we heard in that clip. Get this. She had placed the receipt while she was wearing Rob's jacket that oh. night, which he then took back from her before he went to meet Gacy. That's right. And so that receipt ends up at Gacy's house in the trash can. This ties Gacy directly to Rob Peast. Yes. So police take turns surveilling him in 12-hour shifts. And Gacy was so brazen, he would buy the cops beers when he'd go to the Moose Lodge and they were tagging along. Yeah. And then afterwards, in the wee hours of the morning, he'd go up to the cops. Hey, you want to go get breakfast? <laughs> so they went to the pot and pan diner. Ah. <laughs> the cops would call that he would be charismatic one moment and then lose it in the next, becoming agitated with a freaky look on his face. <laughs> so this surveillance goes on for 10 days. Also interviewed by cops... Remember Michael Rossi and David Cram? Cram! Well, they were the longtime loyal employees of Gacy. And in one of their multiple conversations with police, they admitted that they dug the trenches in his crawl space. They were told that it was so he could install drain pipes. (sighs) And so here's Gacy talking about the crawl space from that same jailhouse interview. I couldn't get down in the crawl space that easy. And then I had a bum back to begin with. You got to crawl on your belly to move around in the crawl space. There is no way that I could have done any of the digging down there. I had enough trouble just getting down there. (laughs) Oh, my God. All right. Well, that clears it up. I got to go bum back. And then there was a rancid smell, which Gacy explained as a sewage issue. And so Michael and David would pour masonry white lime over the smelly spots in order to conceal the odor. About 600 pounds of lime. Yeah. Didn't work. No. When police first saw the crawl space during the first search warrant, they saw no mounds of dirt, so they didn't investigate any further. Nice. So now Gacy's getting very comfortable right before the surveillance ends. He invites the two cops who are on duty to come inside for dinner. Yeah. How would you like to eat a dinner prepared by John Wayne Gacy? (laughs) It's just a dildo on a platter. So one of the cops goes to the bathroom. And as he's in there, the heat kicks in. And with it came the most foul odor he's ever smelled. One odor that's so bad, it can only be attributed to a dead body. So that coupled with Kim Byers' receipt in the trash can and then all that other crap they found, there was now enough evidence to obtain a second warrant. And this is when Gacy is officially arrested and the excavation of the bodies begin. The first things they uncover are two left femurs. So the guy's thinking, normally people don't have two left femurs, so... (laughs) What if they're a bad dancer? There must be more than one victim. Ooh. And so here's a clip of Rafael Tovar, a displays detective, talking about the recovery process. Every day we'd probably come up with a couple, two, three bodies, you know, on a good day, maybe four. And once you got your body completely dug out, we'd videotape it. Starting on the north wall, 
at the front level. door, upper level. The remains of uh, body number five were found. Say this was body such and such, that I go by such and such. And then he'd be put in a body bag, take it out, and then you keep going for your next one. We'd go in there, do the same thing every day, you know. Until about 4.30 in the afternoon when we started bringing the body bags out. And the cameras would roll at that point. And that's when the local news went on. And they could lead the story with it. Everybody got their shots? Wait. Everything got quiet, you know. And you could hear people saying, okay, today, three more. That's, you know, they were counting them. Can you imagine? <sighs> There's so many. They're just coming out with body after body after body. Yeah. My God. So Gacy was arrested on December 22nd, 1978, 11 days after the disappearance of Rob Peast. Oof. Charged with murder. And at first it was just one homicide, Rob Peast, which we found out was not the case. Yeah. He smiled in his mugshot. Oh, that's nice. Because he figured he's going to get away with this too. Of course. Why wouldn't he? He's gotten away with everything. He was released from the sex reformatorium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he confesses to killing and burying 27 boys in his crawl space and backyard, and that he discarded the remaining bodies off the I-55 bridge into the Des Plaines River. At this time, they had to use dental records to identify the victims because DNA was not used in crimes until 1986. Hey. The year we were born. Three things that came into the world, DNA and us. Yeah. (laughs) Many of the victims' families didn't want to cooperate at first because of the negative connotation of homosexuality. That's insane. Yeah, but the thing is... I'd rather not know if that's my son, because gay people disgust me. They weren't all gay, is the thing. A lot of them were because he picked them up at gay clubs, or they were hustling the streets. And that's how the prosecution wanted to paint all the victims. Yeah. As if they were asking for it somehow. But look at Rob Peast. He was all-American high school, Yeah, you know, popular guy. Yeah, just fell for the wrong trick yes (laughs) yeah there was a feeding frenzy at the house bystanders there every day as they discovered more and more bodies like a media feeding frenzy (laughs) yeah people weren't just going there to eat oh jesus so this is a clip of afc chief prosecutor william kunkel talking about this media spectacle kunkel eh people were out there in the snow Chanting like at a football game, the number of body bags being carried into a, a squad roll to be driven to the morgue, uh, like they were counting points in the end zone. Go! It had turned into a circus, an amazing spectacle to this reporter. People bringing brown bag lunches, mothers lifting up small children so they could see the sheriff's officers dumping loads of mud in the driveway, mud that had been part of a grave. And when the people got tired of looking at the house, they could take pictures of each other. See, I was there, where they found the bodies. Oh, original dark tourism. I hate to say it, but we'd probably add it to the tour. Death and Entertainment Tour coming to Los Angeles. Here. Late 2024. Yes. A guy named Sam Amarante took on Gacy as a client to drum up business for his new law practice. Yep. So at first, Gacy confesses to him... And then to the cops, he sat down and he actually confessed and gave them details on what happened to Rob Peast. Yeah. So here's the story he gave. And it's very disturbing. Rob goes up to Gacy that night and Gacy's like, oh, I don't have my paperwork or a pen. How about you hop in and we'll fill out a quick application at the house. (laughs) Great. So Rob jumps in, goes to the house with him, and then... Gacy starts talking about his clown work. And then he tells Rob, hey, I'll show you a neat trick. So Gacy puts on some handcuffs and struggles with them. And then he turns around and whoop, whoop, they're free. Mm -hmm. Rob is wide-eyed. Cool. How did you do that? Easy. I'll show you. So then Gacy puts the handcuffs on Rob And then Rob struggles and struggles and then gives up. Okay, what's the trick? Gacy then reaches into his pocket and pulls out a key. 
The trick is you have to have the key, he tells him. Gacy then rapes Rob mm. and he takes rope and puts it around his neck. Yeah. And he keeps making it tighter and tighter with the knot. And then he gets a phone call, comes back, Rob is dead. Yeah. And so that's some, the phone call's fault. Some people say that he continued to have sex with Rob after he died to rape Rob and that he slept with him all night. Yeah. Gacy, of course, disputes that. Version. I could never. He says he might have slept in the house while Rob's body was there that night. Oh, uh, he slept near the body just like he slept near the embalming room. I get it. And so he went and eventually threw the body over the bridge into the river, he said. Yeah, right. And during the first search warrant, the body was there hidden. Yeah. And they didn't find it. <sighs> Some of these bodies that were discovered in the crawl space were found with cloth in their mouths and ropes around their neck. And he would use this thing called a ligature. Yeah. Put their hands in the board and have rope connected to the board. Yeah. And then twist it. Yep, exactly. And here's a clip of Gacy talking about the trick from that jailhouse interview. The rope trick is not... Uh, the way I've described the rope trick is it's nothing more than an tourniquet. Mm -hmm. And I had explained it to them. I even demonstrated it to them. It would cut off the air. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to kill somebody, you you just put it on their neck and twist it three times or four times or whatever until the person stops moving. Well, it's not about the air. It'll cut your blood supply off to your brain. That'll make you pass out. Well, he wasn't a very smart guy. No, he wasn't. After the disinterment process, 27 bodies were found in the house, one under the barbecue pit, and one in the garage, then three in the river. Four months later, the only name who didn't turn up was Rob Peast, who had set this whole investigation into motion. So as the holidays neared that year, cops asked Gacy to have some compassion for Rob Peast's family and tell them where the body is. So yeah, he, he says, I dumped it in the Des Plaines River because the crawl space was full. And he drew them a rough map of where he buried all the bodies. And it turned out to be completely accurate. Wow. He also detailed how he met each victim, abused them, and ultimately how he killed them and where he buried them. Of course, years later, Gacy would claim that there was no proof of what he said during these interrogations, and he claimed there was never any confession. No, oh, wow. The cops said that they didn't need to film his confession. So. Interesting. And the stories would change. He was like a Jekyll and Hyde. And when lawyers showed up, Gacy started mentioning that there was another guy involved named Jack Hanley. Yes. Who he made up. Yeah. And they found a book in his house on criminal law with the chapter on insanity defense bookmarked. So Gacy clearly read about what you have to say to get the insanity defense. Uh. Later on, he said that he wouldn't have done that knowing what he knew then because he didn't realize if you did that, that that admits guilt uh, yeah exactly because he <laughs> changed the story i was insane saying no that he didn't even do the killing right exactly later on yeah and then when you say i'm insane it's like okay well i did do it but i was crazy and then let's listen to another excerpt from that jailhouse interview i i felt things were going to work out because i knew that i didn't do the killing and i, I thought it would come out in the trial but Amaranti, with, with this insanity defense, what I, and again, you can call it my ignorance of the law. And it's like I explained in a letter to uh, Chief Justice William Clark. The evidence based is on the theory that the more sensational a case is, the more crazier it sounds, the insanity defense would work. And I still think it was stupid. I, I think that they did a disservice to me and they did a disservice to the victims. And you know what? People don't understand. Uh, is I, I feel I was wrongfully convicted for 33 murders, and it was only because of sensationalism and ego. The Displains Police did a sloppy investigation. This, this is, uh, I mean, it may not be the, the correct way of wording it, but the thing of it is is that they had other suspects, and they, they had tunnel vision in to say, Let's, it's Gacy's house, it's easier to put everything on Gacy. Yeah. It's easy because you're the killer. Yeah. On April 9th, 1979, a body is discovered from the Illinois River, hard to identify. Eventually, it's confirmed to be Rob Peast. Oh, I, they did find I didn't realize they found him. Yeah. Wow. And at the time, only 22 of the victims were able to be identified. Mm. 
At one point, the cops go back to talk with Mike Rossi. They go to his house. His girlfriend or wife, whatever, says that he's not home right now, so they're waiting. And as they're waiting, they ask her what kind of car he drives. And then she says, a white Plymouth. Well, later on, the cops notice that one of Gacy's victims, John Zick, also drove a white Plymouth. It was the same car. Mm. And Rossi told police that it had been a gift from Gacy to him. Mm. And he was told that John Zick had run away and sold it to Gacy before he ran away. Oh, my God. I mean, what a shitty fuck. Like, you kill the guy and you take his car. And give it to someone else. It's unbelievable. And they had actually tracked the car to Gacy in 1977, the year before he was arrested. And they bought his story about it. What the f- You can check records on that. It's unbelievable. Ugh. And this guy, Jay Levine, who is a Chicago news anchor, and he was a chief correspondent at the time covering this case, I thought he made a really good point about all the warning signs that were ignored. You never become numb to the scene of a stretcher carried by four men with a white shrouded body lying on top of it. I think the one common thread that runs through all the interviews with the families of the victims is we tried to tell the police. We tried to tell them, but they weren't listening. No, they weren't. Awful. That was a clip from the Devil in Disguise, the Peacock series on Gacy. Yes. Which was very well done. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the victims were portrayed as prostitutes, delinquents, runaways, drug dealers. Well, those are the people you go for if you don't want, you know, immediate response most of the time. That's why so many serial killers will target sex workers. Mm -hmm. Times were different back then. Yeah. Parents let their kids go play all night long, unsupervised. Yeah, come back when the streetlights are on. People weren't easy to get a hold of. There was no texting, no no (laughs) mobile phones. All right, so the trial began in 1980, February, and the judge ruled that Gacy had confessed voluntarily and that Desplaines police officers had sufficient reason to arrest him. Mm. He was the largest mass murderer in the history of the United States. I mean, 33, and I think it's bigger, actually. I think there's a lot that... Imagine when he traveled. Yeah. You think he behaved himself when he went out of town? <laughs> I think he said he admitted to like over 60 or 70. It's crazy. Like that, but they could only tie as many as, yeah, 30 something. So during the trial, things got very emotional. Victims' families were sobbing and hugging each other as the names of the boys were read aloud. Gacy chuckled when it came to John Zick, <sighs> the guy he stole the car from after he killed him. Some of the parents and siblings had to take the stand in order to identify Gacy, which must have been very unnerving. What's with the chuckling about John Zick? Did he he ever say? No, they don't know why. He was tickled. I guess. Wow. There was testimony from Tony Antonucci, who we talked about, one of the people who had worked for him and survived to tell the tale. Yep. He told his story, and then another survivor took the stand reluctantly, but could hardly get a word out, so he was dismissed. Because he was nervous or he was crying? Both. Fuck. A bunch of psychologists interviewed Gacy, six for the defense, six for the state. That's a lot. And they determined that he had borderline personality disorder and displayed signs of antisocial behavior, obviously. (laughs) And his argument was, I was a really social guy. I would host parties. I was dressed as a friggin' Paul Revere. How could you call me antisocial? Yeah. Michael Rossi and David Cram, these two fucking knuckleheads, became state witnesses. Well, they turned states. When Cram was asked if he had a sexual relationship with his boss, he pleaded the fifth. He really crammed it in there. Rossi. (laughs) (laughs) Got him. All right. Rossi hired one of Chicago's most prominent lawyers to back him up. That's kind of interesting. Why would he do that? What's he hiding? Gacy later accused Rossi of killing John Zick for his car. Oh, shit. Naturally, the prosecution thought that Rossi and Cram knew more than they were letting on because a lot of the stories didn't really connect. And they were too close to him to not know more. 
Jeff Rignall, remember he was one of the other guys that survived Gacy? Yeah. He <clears throat> wanted to testify for the prosecution, but was denied because he had published a book at the same time about his experience. But then he was invited to take the stand by the defense in a weird move. Huh. The defense liked what he was saying because Jeff would often call Gacy crazy. So it helped their insanity defense. Crazy Gacy. But he just wanted to tell his story. And he also said that he noticed another person was in the house the night he was tortured. A different light-haired fella performed oral sex on him. You know who had light hair? Ooh. Michael Rossi. Oh, boy. And then Mama Gacy took the stand and testified that Johnny Boy fell down the stairs when he was a little kid and had a head injury. And he couldn't stop sucking cock after. She talked about his epilepsy, how he would pass out all the time, and called his dad a mean, abusive man. Oh, boy. And then she cried out, I still don't believe any of it. He was fucking in your living room, lady. Well, she didn't have her glasses on. Yeah. She's like, are those the throw pillows or the... <laughs> Or a man's balls. Oh, God. Remember Karen Kuzma? Sure do. Gacy's sister? She testified that he probably had two personalities and that the thing that happened with him as a kid, the contractor, contractor affected him, uh, the abused become the abuser kind of shit. Yeah. Horse shit. And then the rest of the trial became about sane versus insane. Anyway, cut to March 1980. It took the jury, seven men, five women, less than two hours to find him guilty of all 33 murders. Two hours. No insanity here. Wow. Just an evil son of a bitch. Mm-hmm. Largest murder conviction in U.S. history. <whistles> he was sentenced to death, and he was imprisoned at Maynard Correctional Facility in Southern Illinois, a large Gothic complex overlooking the Mississippi River. Uh. Gacy told this Plains detective Rafael Tovar that there were possibly more victims. Yeah. A lot of the <laughs> cops involved with the case believe that they don't know the whole story still. <sighs> that brings us to death row. I'm not talking about sugar record night. company. <laughs> I'm not talking about <laughs> sugar bear. So how do you think Gacy passed the time over the years? Uh, probably being a pillar of death row. He explored his artistic side. He became a painter. Oh. The state of Illinois took issue with this, however, and sued him, arguing that he shouldn't be profiting from his crimes because he would sell his paintings, which yeah. often were self-portraits of him as Pogo the Clown, this fucking psychotic narcissist. Yeah. He also ran a 900 number where you could listen to him rant about his innocence. What? And this is the 90s. That's how long he was on death row. Wow. This lasted till the 90s. And that was the heyday of those 900 numbers. Yep. The psychics. Yeah. Call me now. <laughs> there's, there's another fraud. Call, yeah, future episode. There's an Illinois law that says if an inmate can pay for their incarceration, then they should pay. Because it cost about $141,000 to jail him. Isn't that crazy? To house someone on death row, and that's in 90s numbers? Yeah. And so he was obsessed with this civil case going on, even though he was still facing the death penalty. Wow. And at this point, new lawyers come on to the scene around 1993. And this is after all his appeals had been exhausted. These new lawyers tried to prove that he had been out of town when a few of these boys went missing <laughs> and that there were probably other people involved, which a lot of people think. I personally think Michael Rossi and David Cram killed people. Wow. Or at the very least knew about it and mm. buried the people. Holy shit. Don't you think? Could be. All right. Forget it. I've never, I've never explored that. If you're not with that. me, you're against me. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> So here's his new lawyer, Karen Conti, talking about Gacy at this stage in his late life. Another Karen. When he was in prison, he started painting and he sold his paintings. I mean, people wanted to buy his stuff because of his notoriety. He was making money and the state of Illinois was suing him to try to take away his money that he was earning on death row. Right now, Gacy paintings are a big business, big commodity. There's a large call for them. In fact, I think Gacy right now is one of the hottest 
convict painters, I guess, or the death row artists. Yeah, your paintings uh, have improved over the years. I think we've seen some... Uh... I think I've learned from each one of them. Hey. I guess it's the same reason why I relate to Michelangelo, because he, he was a workaholic, and Leonardo da Vinci. You know, people <laughs> always ask me who my favorite artists are and why. And I did not know that Michelangelo was homosexual. It doesn't make no difference to me. <laughs> he was a workaholic. He was a sculptor. He was a, he was a, a painter and, and did a lot of other things. Not a mass rapist uh, and murderer. Da Vinci murder. was a, an inventor in that. And, of course, in, in my life, I've done painting, decorating, wallpapering. I've done mural work. You name it. You've done a lot of things. Jesus. Yeah, the boys Michelangelo fucked. At least got to keep their lives. <laughs> yeah. My God. Lord. So his last appeal was rejected, and the date was officially set for May 10th, 1994. Whoa, my son's birthday. Oh, my God. So a lot of great things happened on May 10th. Yeah. <laughs> the law changed from electric chair to lethal injection. And so this execution became a big event. Just like when they were discovering the bodies at his house. Some people dressed up in clown wigs and they sang, na, 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 hey, hey, goodbye. Wow. Victims' families were put in a different room to watch the execution on a TV set. Come on, let them in the same room. Yeah, let them slap them around. The execution lasted about 18 minutes because one of the IV lines clogged. Oops. It was a malfunction. Yep. That meant Gacy felt way more pain than intended, and he suffocated to death. Of course, most people think that he didn't suffer enough. Yeah. He never apologized for killing all those guys. Well, that's nice. And his last words reportedly were, kiss my ass. Yeah. That's how he really felt. And that brings us to Final Thoughts. After Gacy was executed, that's the end of the story, right, Kyle? Sure. No. Oh! We're going to have to return to this, possibly on a Patreon episode or yeah. even a, a second part. But there may have been a snuff film operation. No way. Going on where they would sell the tapes on the black market. Mm. There's a guy named John Norman who is in jail for assault. And he created this newsletter called The Delta Project, which was a sex trafficking ring. Men looking for boys. Oh, boy. And then he met a guy named Philip Paskey while incarcerated. And Paskey took over the newsletter. This trafficking ring was investigated in 1977, a year before Gacy was caught. Hmm. One time, as Gacy recalled... David Cram had brought this Phil Paskey guy over to the house and they would hang out, drink beers. And Phil Paskey was still working for that John Norman guy who had started that newsletter for the trafficking ring. Yeah. Paskey actually had ties to John Norman and Gacy. So I want to know what's the crossover here? <sighs> There's got to be some sort of crossover. So we got to look into this further <clears throat> sometime. Yeah. Another part of the case is there was this retired Chicago homicide detective named William Dorsch. Met Gacy in 1974. Their families had dinner together when Gacy was still with Carol and the girls. And it came up in conversation that Gacy was the maintenance guy at the apartment where he had his mother holed up. Oof. which is located at the corner of Miami and Elston in Chicago. So he would, you know, pour concrete at the plumbing, and Dorsch actually lived a few doors down from the building. A few doors down. <laughs> <laughs> One time he saw Gacy carrying a shovel. It was about 3 a.m. Oh, doing a little night digging. Yeah, so <laughs> what are you up to? Uh, Gacy tried to make a joke of it, like, ah, there's not enough hours in the day to get things done. <laughs> Another neighborhood boy who mowed lawns and lived nearby witnessed Gacy digging four-foot trenches. And then another neighbor remembered seeing Gacy drag large garbage bags across the yard in the middle of the night. Normal. And yet another guy who lived in the building would wake up to loud hammering in the middle of the night. When he called in his tip, police told him, quote, we don't want any more bodies. <laughs> You seeing a pattern here? What is going on? Cops don't want to be disturbed yeah. from their donut break. Oh, boy. I love cops. Shots fired. Come on. Mac, I love cops, okay? <laughs> 
And then when the trial started, Dorsch informed investigators about the incident he witnessed. Oh, Dorsch. And then claimed none of the leads were ever followed up again. Jesus. But then in 1998... It got some media attention, and they actually convinced the Chicago PD to dig in the yard of the apartment building because of all the evidence Ooh. and witnesses. Oddly enough, they only dug in two spots after receiving evidence by a radar company saying that there was some disturbance in the soil. But they came up with nothing and closed the case. Now, that's weird because they only dug up in two little spots. Yeah. And it's not that huge of a yard, but... Why not just dig up the whole thing? Let's find these bodies and ID them. Right. But they want nothing to do with it. As far as the police are concerned, it's a closed case. Oh, boy. Philip Paskey died in 1998, John Norman in 2009, and David Cram killed himself in 2001. So there's not much to be learned from them. They didn't talk about this in their lifetimes that much. Jeez. Michael Rossi is still out there. Oh, wow. We need to get him... Get in, in here, here. Yeah. and ask him some questions. Chris Todd and accuse him of murder. <laughs> in 2011, Thomas Dart, the sheriff of Cook County, which is Chicago, reopened the case because they wanted to start identifying the unknown victims. Yeah. One of them, which was known as victim number 19, was ID'd as William Bundy. Bill Bundy. And then another one in 2017 was ID'd as Jimmy Hotskin. Hakonskin. Hakonson. Hakonson. H- whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad to say. Yeah. I'm sorry. H A E E K O N S I N. R I P. Hakonson. On the flip side, there was a victim named Michael Marino who was confirmed to have been a mistake. His mm-hmm. family now believes that he was not, in fact, a Gacy victim and was misidentified. Oh, wow. I think five victims remain unidentified to this day. That's crazy. So they're asking families, hey, you got any DNA evidence? Let's do this. Mm. Just a couple last things. There's a podcast called The Clown and the Candy Man has just made this claim that John Gacy may have been connected to another serial killer named Dean Coral who murdered about the same number of boys over in Texas. And so there's evidence that these two are linked by this network of pedophiles, which is financed by prominent members of society, apparently. Oh, my God. So that's something we'll return to as well. Wow. A lot going on here. The house itself, uh, in 1979, it was razed, which means demolished. Destroyed. And then a three-bed, two-bath home was erected, no pun intended, on the property in 1986. Boy, oh, 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 oh. In 2004, the home was sold for 300 grand to what appears to be a bank or something, according to the property records. Hmm. And then 15 years later, went up for sale again. It was offered with a 19% discount. Wow, sold during the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. And so this real estate appraiser in an article on Realtor.com said, quote, the stigma runs with the land, not the house. Jeez. You've got bad juju there associated with that specific geographic location. You think? Come on now. Wow. I end here with a clip of Quiet on Set. Oh, I know what the... What, yeah. Drake sense. Bell had an interesting story about his abuser, Brian Peck. But just to paint a picture, probably a bad choice of words with what oh, I'm about to say. Oh, God. But it's happening to you as there's a painting hanging on the wall that was painted by John Wayne Gacy. He had letters in his bedside table. He was a pen pal with John Wayne Gacy. You had him sign the painting, right? On the back? It said, from your good friend, John Wayne Gacy, on the back of this painting. And things are happening to me in a room where there's a painting by one of the most prolific serial killers who preyed on young boys staring at me. So now that puts into my mind How far is this really going to go? How far can this go? The fear that you're going through, not only because of what's happening to you in the moment, but you're going, how far can this really go? What is really going on in this person's mind? God, I hate when people say prolific serial killer. It's not prolific. It's fucking deranged. It's pro-deathic. Yeah. Nice.
<laughs> you think Alan Thicke went up to Drake and said, quit your whining. Yeah. It's a good painting, kid. Jesus. All right, Kyle. Yeah. What are your final thoughts? God, we need better policing in this country. I feel they could have prevented at least 20 of those murders Yeah, with following up on this creep. Yeah, and if you're a violent pedophile that's supposed to be in prison for over 10 years and they let you out 10 years too early, um, yeah, that's a problem. And you can just move to another location, start it all up, and do even worse things. But yeah, I think I had no idea about the uh, possible involvement of the other scumbags. Mm -hmm. But that's very interesting. I know. it's There's a lot to uncover because on its surface, it's one of the most horrendous crimes in American history. And yeah. The amount of bodies. But disturbingly enough, it makes perfect sense that there's even more. Yeah. And that there's even more to the whole story. Like it doesn't just end there. Yeah. And you wonder how these scumbags just find each other. So I've never had anybody come up to me and be like, oh, you doing any pedophile lately? Doesn't usually work out because that's what <laughs> Mark Salling did from Glee. Yeah. Goes to his girlfriend at the time like, hey, check out this child porn I got yeah. going on here. <laughs> you like this or what? And she goes, no. Yeah, barking Pre up the wrong tree with that one. Proceeds to call the cops on him. That's how it should go every time. Yes. So how do you find people that go, yes. Absolutely. I thought you were never going to say it. I love that. <laughs> Crazy. It's creepy, man. Yeah. And as Jack Merrill pointed out in the article I read, he's the actor. Yeah. Who we're going to talk to hopefully soon and see his one man show. Yes. He said that people would come up to him almost giddy. Tell us about Gacy. Oh, my God. That there's a cultural fascination with him. Yeah. And with creepy clowns. That's I mean, deranged. Terrifier 3 is scaring up the box office. Yep. Shout out to a friend of the show, Paul Wiley, who did the scoring of the soundtrack and, uh, you know, all that. And then in Joker 2, Joaquin Phoenix's backing band during one of the musical numbers is named the Pogos. Yeah. Reference to Gacy. And in Joker 1, it's Pogos Comedy Club. Ah, so, so brilliant. Yeah. Todd Phillips. Jeez, what a hack. Oh, boy. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino said that uh, you were telling me this, and I looked it up today. And I don't think it's actual praise. I think it might be a dig. Mm. He's like, man, he Phil Todd Phillips is the Joker, man. Yeah, that's true. He's saying F you to anyone who wanted to see the movie, the studios who paid the money for it. I think he's just calling Todd Phillips a clown. But it, <laughs> who gets the last laugh there? I mean, we're the audience that are bored stiff during it. Yeah, exactly. I don't care if it's a middle finger to the studio, because it's also a middle finger to me. That's right. All right. Well, this was, was. This, this was. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> the Crypt Keeper wants to say something. Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. First draft Crypt Keeper. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Fortunately for Gacy, the show doesn't always go on. That's one circus I'm glad left town. Mr. Gacy was truly a horrible boss. Talk about a dead-end job. There was no future in it. <laughs> wow. Hope you dug tonight's fiendish fable. It really cut me bone deep. I better get back to the crypt before I get too choked up. Thanks for ghosting me tonight. I've had a frightfully fun time. You know what they say. Eat, drink, and be buried. <laughs> Pleasant screams. All right, you too. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to see him again. Anything else? I think that might be it. I'm spent. Yeah. Boy, now I got to eat my Halloween candy. <laughs> In somber remembrance of uh, all that we lost during this episode. Yes. R.I.P. to all the victims. Yes. And if you get an apple from your neighbor, make sure to check if there's a razor blade in it. Because mm. we want y'all safe. Yes. We want y'all giving us five stars wherever you're listening to this <laughs> and possibly writing a few kind words. Yes. Spreading the love. There you go. And until next week. Don't go dying on us. Bye. Bye. You have just heard a true Hollywood murder mystery. I have never seen anything like this before. <laughs> the movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it. A place that manufactures nightmares. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Good night. 
Please drive home carefully and come back again soon.